ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I'd like to begin by briefly thanking all the kind friends who've helped me and allowed me to steal their ideas. However, as I must misunderstood half of what they told me, you can't blame them. Um, and also to thank Stephen, because so much of what he said I'm going to say again, and we didn't collude beforehand. So it proves that great minds think alike. So, for our purposes this afternoon, the, the late medieval period is defined as 1057 to 1560. In effect, Malcolm III to the Reformation. We begin with Scotland as a recognizable kingdom, an emerging system of urban centers, especially under David I, and a church largely integrated into the mainstream of European Christianity. We end after many adventures with Scotland still an independent and integrated kingdom about to embark on the linked adventures of a new relation with its large neighbor to the south and a new form of Christianity. In Perth and Kinross, we inherit some of the important centers of the early medieval period that we've heard of already. Schoon, obviously, but Fortiviet, Dunkeld, Abernethy, and all of these have seen significant archaeological investigation, especially, of course, Fortiviet and Cerf, which we've heard about this afternoon. And all of them continue to play some role in uh, medieval Scotland. In Perth, we have one of the leading urban centers of the kingdom, made a royal borough by David I in the 12th century, but already in, in existence at the beginning of the millennium, and with very close links to its older neighbor at Schoon. Population, Malcolm's kingdom, as we all know, was a, a fusion of Picts, Scots, Britons, Scandinavians, Northumbrians, and then joined by Norman and Breton mercenaries and adventurers, and the various craft workers who move in from England and continental Europe, especially the Flemish, and especially in the boroughs. That understanding, which a lot of us were sort of taught at school or picked up along the way, is derived mainly from documentary sources, from place name evidence, from artifacts. At the moment, there isn't a lot of biological evidence for the composition and origins of the later medieval population in our area. And now let's see if I can advance this. Which button shall I press? This one. Middle one? Oh, right. I'd have got to it in the end, but there we are. Let's see. We have some very significant burial assemblages in Perth, uh, especially from the, the religious houses, but those haven't received uh, the full range of modern genetic and isotope analysis and dating techniques. Research has taken place, some has taken place in Edinburgh and some is now taking place in Aberdeen, looking for example at isotope signatures to work out where people came from, and that includes Perth assemblages. The pathology of burial assemblages has been studied, but not exhausted. The impact, for example, of the Black Death must have been enormous, but is not well understood in Scotland. Similarly, the impact of documented famines ought to be visible biologically. Similarly, age structures. We know something about them, but not as much as we ought to know about the age structures of populations. There have been some sophisticated excavation techniques and sampling techniques proposed, but I am not sure that they will all work in cramped urban burial sites. This is Whitefriars. I think the prophet Ezekiel would have struggled to work out who belongs to whom in all of that. Derek Hall did extremely well to sort it out. It may be that some less difficult rural site will appear. For example, like this site unpublished at Balumbi in Angus. Curation of large burial assemblages for future analysis is a serious problem. Aberdeen, for example, and Edinburgh have both absorbed some of the, the population of medieval Perth and have an interest in doing so. In some ways, it's a specifically medieval problem. Earlier populations don't produce quite the numbers that we get in, uh, for medieval assemblages in Scotland. And in later periods, we're a bit more constrained by ethical considerations, for example, living relatives, or by the fact that we can gain some of the information in other ways, for example, from documentary records. But for the Middle Ages, we start to get big numbers, literally lorry loads as there, which are difficult to store, 
but actually crucially important. There's a huge amount that the chaps in those boxes can tell us about themselves. And it will take many years. And there are methods that we haven't thought of yet. So that's a problem. Conflict. We have a number of medieval combat sites in our area. Medvan, for example, Dublin Moor, the famous Battle of the Clans on the, uh, the North Inch, which of course is not quite a battle in the normal sense of the word. Battlefields excite a certain romantic interest, um, and there has been quite serious topographic survey of some battlefields in other parts of Scotland. We've done a tiny amount of work on battlefields around Stirling, uh, metal detecting and so on, come out up in small fragments. Our experience has been that medieval battlefields don't tell as much as you would hope from things like metal detecting, because you just either what you find is very sparse or it's mixed up with much later stuff. And it's not really until you get into the age of firearms with projectiles that can't be recovered on the day, for example, Kitty Cranky or Dunkeld or famously Culloden, that you start to get really interesting results from surface scatters. That may change. We might be wrong. We might be missing something. But that's, that's one consideration. Parath, of course, was besieged in the 1310s and the 1340s. And there are the famous stone shot that came from the ditches in Mill Street, um, which, uh, which are now in the museum, which demonstrate that some conflict evidence can survive. Land use and settlement, upland and lowland, that's been a recurring theme for almost everybody who's spoken here today. Because our area has such a variety of terrain, high mountains down to waterlogged valleys and everything in between, lots of flooded mosses and karst lands, and quite a lot more or less uninhabitable until the age of improvement. Some areas have seen important study, very notably the Royal Commission surveys up in the highlands of Perthshire. Um, the Laura's Project survey, which covered many periods, but including material from the later medieval period around Loch Tay and Ben Laura's. And of course, uh, Perth and Ross Heritage Trust's investigations up at Lair by Glen Shee. But it's difficult to find the lowland settlements, which has already been pointed out by, by Stephen, um, must have supported the majority of the population. And a number of people have said, as we've heard already, that a lot of them may be underneath later farms, and a lot would have been ploughed out by later cultivation. They might appear as crop marks, or they may be under existing steadings. That's significant because so many steadings are now being disused, demolished, converted to other uses, and a lot of them are being investigated. But again, our problem is that the medieval farms are probably very lightly built, whereas the improvement period steadings are massive. And after you've driven, been driving tractors the size of railway engines over a site um, for about 30 years, a lot of stuff will have vanished. Um, SCARF identified the need for documentary and field research combined to understand the pattern of rural settlement. And I think that remains true. On the higher ground, forestry and wind farm projects expose quite large areas, and they could provide the trigger for large area documentary and landscape surveys that might give us significant settlement evidence there. The relation between highland and lowland settlement is particularly interesting in our area. We know, for example, of the shielding pattern of transhumans with upland outposts dependent on a lowland base in the early modern period. And I think one of the questions that emerged at Lair was whether and to what extent people are moving up and down in different conditions. Is this a later medieval pattern as well as an early modern pattern? It may be that some sites that we think of as shielding sites or as clearance sites actually conceal much earlier medieval evidence underneath them. So there's a whole area of research there that might answer some of our questions. There are some very clever soil analysis techniques um, now available to look at the ways that the soils themselves have been modified by cultivation, what are known as anthrosols. Those should be feasible in the areas where there is the possibility of finding undisturbed soils that haven't been completely ploughed out and, and modified beyond recognition 
in recent times? That's one of the questions that we need to ask. Historic climate change is another question that's already been raised several times this afternoon because that will have affected the habitability of upland areas. Um, Derek has kindly pointed out that the, the, the Deer Park study at Father Dykes found rig and furrow about 270 metres OD in the 13th and 14th centuries. And I believe the Laura's project as well found medieval buildings at quite high altitude. Wetlands will have been only marginally habitable and we have some significant wetlands in our area, for example, Methlin Moss and the Karas of Gowrie. And as I'm sure you know, the, the monastic cited in Jaffrey, the name meaning Island of the Masses or something of like that. Not Masses as in lots of people, but Masses as in religious services. And all those inch names in the Karas of Gowrie that indicate islands of habitability in a, an otherwise uninhabitable waterlogged terrain. And that, again, would have changed over time as the, the climate becomes either cooler or warmer or wetter or drier. And also, as it's deliberately modified, it's known that some of the monastic houses were intentionally draining and improving some of the karst lands. One possible route into rural settlement is some of the high-status sites, um, castles, moated sites, motts, monastic ranges. Gazetteers were produced some years ago of, um, of, of some of those classes of site, which were based on documentary and field research. Obviously, the high status sites aren't typical. And in the case of the Grange sites, they may have been deliberately planted on marginal areas to improve their productivity. But they tend to be traceable in the documentary records. And some of them are substantial enough to survive as, as recognisable remains, and perhaps be the centre and focus of a wider agricultural landscape. Similarly with, um, with uh, hunting parks, a special class of, of rural land use, surviving because of royal connections uh, in the documents and on the ground, because it's often beyond the reach of modern cultivation. Landscape studies, and, and of course there's been a lot of discussion today about the the study of things like pollen cores and so on. And the University of Stirling have done a lot of work in this area, looking at habitability and land use, combining documentary and scientific techniques. Field walking has a part to play here too because of the ubiquitous scatters of potsherds, which can be very disappointing in some ways because they were spread as manuring on fields. But they do offer datable evidence of cultivation in an area. Similarly, the maps of Timothy Pont, just beyond the limit of our time period, but of course recording the landscape that was there already. I'm quite interested in churches, and I'm pleased that so many other people have flagged this up already today, because I think we might, to some extent, be able to use them as a kind of proxy for the vanished ordinary, in quotation marks, lowland settlements. They tend to survive in the documentary records, on the ground. They survive as ruins, they can survive as newer buildings on an ancient site, or as foundations beneath the ground. And they can mark the first focus of a, a rural settlement that has since been redeveloped beyond recognition. Many are still in use as, as churches. And as such, they undergo all sorts of interventions, for example, here at Abernight, similarly at Inch Tour. In order to remain in use as churches, they have to be altered and modified and modernized. And that can provide a route into investigation. Others are um, now redundant and quite drastically derelict. This is a, the example of Dron, which some of you may know, just by Bridge of Erin. And a church site like that, which is you know, early 19th century building on a very old site, that building is not going to stay like that forever. Something's going to happen there. And that, again, will provide a route into further investigation. There is a national corpus of medieval churches, and it does cover our area. Urban settlement. Perth. Perth was a major centre of royal administration. It was arguably the, the emerging national capital. Perth schoolchildren have often been taught in school that Perth was the capital of Scotland. And it's almost true 
if only we hadn't murdered King James. But um, it, in many ways, it was emerging as effectively a national capital. And of course, its depth and quality of archaeology have made it just about the most intensively studied urban centre in Scotland. It's defined by its position, as you see here, the crossing of the Tay, exposed to flooding, and by its topography constrained to be, in effect, a square platform in the swamp. I think you can even see, or just about, the way that the medieval core of Perth, bounded by the inches north and south, is very much a square platform. And up until um, early modern times, all the surrounding area was subject to flooding, was wet and damp. Um, it has one of Scotland's most important parish churches, as we all know. It has four religious houses, um, two of which have been excavated, and it has a number of small chapels. It also has a well-defined street plan and burgage plot system, a defensive circuit, significant public buildings, and a complex of urban industries. And all these have been investigated, some quite extensively. The street plan is quite a rare example to study a medieval town in detail. The settlement probably grew up along the Watergate, um, and that, if you recognise the shop sign, that dates the photograph and also flags up one of the reasons why that street and that site are important. Um, it hasn't, Skinner Gate is thought to be where the, where the borough developed. It hasn't been tested by excavation. There was a watching brief in the 1990s behind St Matthew's Church that found medieval deposits very near the surface. But the archaeology is shallower than normal there, indicating that it is a natural dry ridge, which attracted early settlement. There hasn't been much development pressure recently um, in Skinner Gate, but um, there are things rumbling in the background, which some of us have heard about. Things may happen there, and it's very, very strategic archaeologically. South Street's always been the poor relation of High Street, laid out in the 12th century, and hasn't really been ex investigated on the same scale as the High Street. There are lots of gap sites and vulnerable buildings which may become available. Skinnergate is a most intriguing uh, insertion into the grid. Um, that's a very old photograph of Skinnergate deliberately. There's um, the, the defensive circuit's been investigated at various times, but again, not well understood. Probably developed piecemeal. We have the mill laid. We have a harbour and the toll booth at the end of the high street, both of them known uh, from maps and watching briefs. And the earliest bridge stood nearby, just downstream of that bridge. St John's Kirk has been investigated quite a lot and will be investigated again. Famously, of course, we have the, the burial place of James I, the, the, the charter house, the Carthusians. Nothing known above ground, but it's there, and that may well be investigated one of these days. Franciscan Friary, largely uninvestigated. The walls of standing buildings, that's the inside of the building where Sainsbury's now is in the high street. Party walls preserve early archaeology above ground. I won't spend time, but if you look at that structure for a while, you'll see that there's some very early masonry inside it. Um, that's underneath Perth Theatre, where you have um, a rather substantial building surviving in backgrounds. That was a, a, excavated not long ago. Turning to the smaller settlements, we know so little about them. We know very little about the smaller settlements that exist in Perth. Um, they are, have been investigated piecemeal. There's Schoon, our, de our deserted borough just across the river. In Perth, we know that standing buildings preserve interesting remains, such as, for example, under the King James pub. But it might be that something similar is happening in some of those smaller settlements that hasn't yet been investigated. And there may be scope for further investigation of the small settlements. Food and drink. Most of the major industries in Perth are connected with food and drink, with lots of animal bone and shell, and all sorts of trades and crafts connected with things like spinning and the processing of textiles. One of the crucial things is that a lot of the products are rural, but a lot of the evidence is urban. Again, isotope analysis of, the, of things like animal bone could tell us a lot more than we know at the moment. 
about how stuff is moving and where it's coming from and where it's going to. The evidence will be urban, but the, um, but the, the significance covers the whole of Perth and Kinross. That's, uh, I mention that building again because it's, amongst other things, the, uh, the home of, of, of uh, one of the craft guilds. I'm skipping through here. Pottery is a hugely important thing. IPCS study of, of where pots come from. We know that there were big industries in, in, in our area, but where are the kilns? That we don't know. Derek would love to know. There must be ways of finding out, and it's one of, one of our gaps. Field walking, for example, to find things like kiln props because that sort of stuff doesn't travel far. Huge assemblages of pottery from Perth sites. Again, that problem, those assemblages are going to tell us a lot over future years, but they have to be stored in the meantime. So same problem as the skeletons, how to store assemblages for years so that they can be studied in the future. Uplands, that's an interesting example of an upland track. What's the transport system? What's the, what's the system by which goods move around in later medieval Perth? They arrive in the boroughs eventually, but how do they get here? What's the system? It would be nice to know a lot more than we do at the moment. Churches as churches, as well as, 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 well as proxies for, for settlement. Some, some buildings, like Dunkeld, attract specialist study, but there's a whole raft of, of studies that could be done on the evidence of, um, of, of religious practice in Perth. That's post-medieval, but I put it up, it's from Fortingale, and I put it up because where you expect memento mori, what it actually says is cogna chambas, remember death in Gaelic. The interface between Gaelic and English, Highland and Lowland. And that's one of our interesting questions for, 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 for today, I think. Religious practice in the, the form of things like burial practice here at Whitefriars, this chap here with a walking stick, a staff of some sort in his grave. They get evidence of something. Evidence of music, bone flute from Skinnergate. And ordinary things like bell buckles, that came from a watching brief in Kirk Close. Knowledge gaps, those are my gaps. I won't spend too long on them right now. We can discuss them more later. But things like age structure and the Black Death, lowland rural settlements, how Kinross developed as a borough? That's our other county town. We know so little about it. Um, smaller urban settlements we know so little about. And the castles, they have a lot to tell us about rural settlement. I'm running out of time, so I'll flick fairly quickly through the future research project priorities. I think these will go up on the PCAF website in due course, um, and people will be able to look at them and comment on them there. I grouped them under the different themes I've flagged up already, and most of them I've already mentioned. Yes. So that's a bit of a whistle-stop whistle -stop tour of the archaeology that we have in our area in the later medieval period. I'll stop there for now and hand back to Gavin.